From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Betty, Mr. Dollar. Betty... Miss Crane's maid. I'm the one who... Well... Oh, yeah. What can I do for you, Betty? Have you told anyone about it? The gun? No, not yet. Oh, thank heaven. Do you still have it? What do you think I'd do? Bury it somewhere? Look, Mr. Dollar... No, you look. Somebody's used this gun, used it recently. Who was it? You? No, I never saw it before. Then why were you trying to hide it in the incinerator? I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing. Is it your gun? I found it. Where? Please. Is it tied in with the theft of Miss Crane's necklace? I don't know anything about it, about about anything. I, I just know I'm in trouble. You've got to help me, Mr. Dollar. Please. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the crane matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item seven, $3.10 for a bad steak and worse coffee in the hotel dining room. But it didn't matter much. I had to rush it anyway with one eye on my watch. I was meeting jewel thief Swanny Prell at his rooming house at 9 o'clock. And Melba Crane's maid, Betty, was coming here to the hotel at 10, providing she could slip away from the house. The schedule was tightening up on me, but I still hadn't seen hide nor hair of the stolen necklace. That is, if hide nor hair can apply to a string of match pearls insured for $20,000. North Oak Street was in a lost and forgotten corner of town, dark and nearly deserted at this hour of the evening. The rooming house, a ramshackle frame built flush to the sidewalk, seemed to wait for me, brooding and silent. There were no names on the letterboxes and no sign of an office. I tried the front door. It was open. Room six was the number Smiley had given me. I walked down the long hall, studying the numbers on the doors with a dim light from a single bulb at the far end. Four, five, six. I heard the barest hint of movement behind the door, then silence. I reached down quietly and turned the knob. The door was unlocked. I took a deep breath and then went in fast. What the devil? Take it easy, Mac. All right, hold it now until I find the light switch. Uh, Well? Well, I'll be. Mr. (laughs) Dodd. Aren't you a little out of your territory, Mr. Crane? I, I don't know what you mean. Sit I, down before you shake your teeth loose. I beg your pardon, sir. Don't mention it. If I may remind you who you're talking you to. You don't have to remind me. You're Phineas P. Crane, uncle of Miss Melba Crane, who had a pearl necklace stolen from her. You're one of the last two surviving members of the Crane family who founded Crane's. Mr. Dollar, I... And I have just caught you prowling the room of a known professional jewel thief. Now sit down. Uh... I can explain this, sir. Yeah, I hope so. I suppose our host isn't home. There's no one else here. Was the door unlocked? Or were you equipped with a set of keys? I beg your pardon. Again? You're the most polite burglar I've ever tagged. This is not the way it seems, I assure you. All right, now you've assured me. Convince me. Uh, I came to ask some questions of the gentleman who lives here. Do you know him? Certainly not. It's hardly likely that I'd be acquainted with a person of his type. Oh, I don't know. He's a jewel thief. Your niece had a necklace stolen ten days ago. It kind of adds up in a way. Oh, it... Well, now, are you accusing me of complicity? I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just trying to find out what you were doing hiding here in Smiley Prell's room. I... I came here to talk to him. What about? But the reasons are personal, Mr. Dollar. Then you did know him. No, I... I... I knew he lived here. Because I, I followed him one day. I, I didn't know his name. I didn't know he was a jewel thief. Until you said so just a moment ago. Uh, well, I know. I know. This seems rather odd. Yeah, well, that's one way of putting it. Uh, you'd understand if I were in a position to explain. 
It might be a good idea if you got in that position, in view of the circumstances. I simply cannot. And I do not believe your capacity is such that you can force me to. You're quite right. But the police might handle it somewhat differently. Oh, I doubt it very much. My grandfather founded this town. <laughs> yes, they remember that here. A matter of pulling rank. Huh? Oh, I think they'd lean toward believing any reasonable story that I might give them. A story like that is reasonable only as long as there's no actual evidence to disprove it. Oh, is that so? And you have such evidence? Not yet, but I think I will before long. Oh, <laughs> well, then I'll have to deal with that eventuality when and if it happens. Who are you trying to protect, Mr. Crane? I... I don't know what you mean. Why did you follow Smiley? Because I saw him under rather unusual circumstances. Before or after the robbery? Both. Well, a uh, after. Yes, when I followed him. When was that, tonight? Uh, no, that was several days. But did I... Did you expect him to be here tonight? Or were you counting on his room being empty? I did not come here to commit burglary. <laughs> May I remind you, sir? Oh, yeah, I... I know. You're Phineas P. Crane, and you and your niece are the tip-top aristocrats on the local totem pole. Also, I happen to know your flat I beg I your imagine $20,000 worth of insurance would look pretty good to you. I am not a thief. People have an odd moral sense sometimes. A lot of them seem to think insurance fraud is not quite the same as actual Did theft. I do not happen to be one of those persons, Mr. Dodd. What about your niece? Uh, well, that necklace was given to her as an engagement gift by the man she's going to marry. And I'm sure its value to her is much more than the amount of the insurance. Maybe, and maybe not. You did tell me this afternoon that she's headstrong, impulsive. Oh, yes, but I... I did not mean to imply, sir. All right, Mr. Crane. I imagine you'll be around when I want you. You're not the kind of man who runs away. So for the moment, play it your way. Cover up and hide behind the family name. But sooner or later, you're going to have to talk it out with somebody. Either with me or someone else. Am I free to go now? <laughs> sure. Sure, as far as I'm concerned. Unless you want to stick around and wait for Smiley. Well, I doubt whether there's much point in that now. Under the circumstances. Good night, sir. Keep cool, Mr. Crane. I shall make every effort to. As soon as Crane left, I made a quick search of the room and found nothing. Smiley evidently traveled light and lived light. There was hardly any sign he was even living in the place. I gave it up as a bad job, finally, closed the door behind me and drove back to my hotel. I was starting to see a faint gleam of daylight in the case, but I couldn't quite figure how Phineas Crane fit into it. And unfortunately, I was in no position to push him very hard, since technically I had no more right in that room than he did. But all of my theories fell apart when I walked through the door of my hotel room. Come right in, son. Have a seat. Thanks. One of us could be in the wrong room, of course. Not if your name's Dollar. Oh, I wasn't questioning my presence, Mr. Uh... You know a fellow named Smiley Prell? Well, I know who he is. Got business with him, have you? Maybe. Do I uh, have any with you? Well, my name's Durham, Mr. Dollar. Ed Durham. Oh, well, it's a little late, Mr. Durham, so if you don't mind. I'm chief of police here in Cranesburg. Oh. Well, maybe it's not as late as I thought. Found your name where this fellow Prell had wrote it down, along with your room number here at the hotel. Eh, careless of him. Kind of helpful, though. He a friend of yours? Uh, no, no, I'd hardly call him that. Oh, I don't see any point in holding out on you, Chief Durham. Here are my credentials. I'm an insurance investigator working on that crane robbery. You don't say. Smiley Prell is a jewel thief. Two previous convictions. He phoned the insurance company in Hartford and wanted to talk a deal. I flew in here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, these seem to be in order, all right. Thanks. I had an appointment to meet Prowl this evening in his rooming house at 9 o'clock, but he didn't show. Reckon he wasn't in what shape to, Mr. Dollar? Oh, what do you mean? Prell got himself shot four or five hours ago. Shot? Yeah, real shot. Matter of fact, he's dead. Murdered? Kind of looks that way. Found him in a back alley behind the city park. Must have happened sometime this afternoon. You wouldn't know anything about it, would you, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I don't know. I might. Do you know what kind of a gun was used to kill him? Thirty-two revolver, according to the boys in ballistics. Well, 
Hold on to your hat. I may have it right here. Uh, don't bother looking under the mattress, Mr. Dollar. What? I already found it. Yep, got it right here. You're pretty cagey, aren't you? Wasn't sure how to figure you. Reckon you're all right, though, or you'd have kept your mouth shut. Well, thanks. How'd you come by it? I took it away from Melba Crane's housemate, a girl named Betty. Yeah, I know who she is. It was some time between 6.30 and 7 this evening. I caught her trying to hide it in the incinerator. You don't say. It's been fired, as you undoubtedly noticed. You might have it checked through, but I don't imagine it's registered. It's registered, all right. Oh? We don't have many guns around here. I recognize this one right off. Belongs to Phineas Crane. What? Add up to anything, Mr. Dollar? Not the way I've been adding. Well, it's got me stumped, too. I, uh... I don't suppose you found that necklace on Smiley Prell's body. No, not a sign of it. You figure, then, this murder is tied up some way with that robbery? What else is it to figure? What about these Cranes, Chief? Just who are they? What are they? Well, they're an old line family. Just two of them left now, Phineas and Melba. Not as wealthy as they used to be, maybe. Milton Borkley at the bank told me the same thing. Funny thing about that, though. Lately, at least, old Phineas seems to have plenty of cash to jingle together. How lately? Well, not just since the robbery, if that's what you mean. It's longer than that. Last four or five months. Well, that checks, too, with what Borkley said. You got some idea they planned that robbery, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I don't know. I've got no evidence of it, if that's what you're asking. How do Phineas and Melba get along together Well, they're kind of like royalty here, you know. Live pretty much to themselves. And if they do have any trouble, it's never heard outside the house. Uh Uh-huh. What do you know about Melba's fiancé, this Dean Sellers? Well, he's been here about eight months. Seems to be a pretty nice fellow. Civic leader and all that. Everybody in town thought it was just fine when they got engaged. Figured they was meant for each other. Well, he certainly goes in for lavish gifts. A necklace with 38 match pearls is quite Expecting somebody? Yeah, quiet. Who is it? Betty. Let me in, Mr. Dollar. Oh, just a minute. She phoned earlier, wants the gun back. Maybe you'd better listen in from the the bathroom there. Good idea. Let me get set. Okay, right. Come in, Betty. Thank you. I've got to have it back, Mr. Dollar. Have what back? The gun you were trying to hide in the incinerator this evening? Yes, of course. You mean this one? Oh, yes. Please, Mr. Dollar. Somebody's trying to get me into trouble. Who? I don't know. I found that gun. That's the truth. Found it where? Hidden in a drawer in my room out at the cranes. Who put it there? I don't know. I don't know. When I saw it, I got scared. I was trying to get rid of it when you stopped me. And now, tonight, on the radio, it says a man's been shot. Did you know him? No. Do you know whose gun this is? I don't know anything about it. Oh, give it to me, please. I'd like to, Betty. But I'm afraid things aren't that simple. What do you mean? All right, Chief. It's all yours. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a castle crumbles. Cupid goes to jail. And a lovely iceberg thaws a bit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> 